Let's keep lifting one another up, guys, uh, remembering that um, um, we can encourage one another, uh, but one of the greatest ways that I think we encourage one another is through praying for one another. So let's make sure that we're just not walking up and down the hall saying, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, and never pray. Let's, let's hold one another up in, in prayer. Um, and and uh, I know that God, God is faithful when we, when we pray. I want to say thank you to everyone for a great SCW. Uh, it was an amazing time. We're still going through... Yeah, praise God. We're still going through the um, we're still going through the uh, forms, but but as of now, we know documented we have uh, eight kids who who made commitments to Jesus during SCW uh, for the first time. So that's that's pretty remarkable and and pretty awesome. So we thank God for that. So um, and and. Maybe there were more. We're still getting some of the feedback forms in, uh, and that's just secondary. So we know a lot happened in the elementary that we're uh, going to be seeing over the next few days. So as all that information comes in, we'll share that uh, with all of you. But thank you for your part in making it a great week. Well, let's jump into Mark 11. Um, such a great, such a great chapter. Um, and, and there's so many lessons that we could really pull out of Mark 11, uh, but I'm going to focus in on, on one story individual, uh, one story in particular uh, that, that I just find fascinating. This past weekend I was in Jakarta and um, went into this, um, you, you ever walk into one of those places and you realize really quick you're way out of your league? I walk into this, this mall, the, what is it, the Pacific Place Mall, I think, something like that. I walk in here and very, very quickly I realize this mall is way out of my league. Like it's one of those malls you go into and every store you're like, kids, don't touch anything because we can't afford anything on these shelves. And in fact, there was this one store that was a secondhand store and I thought, this is awesome. Like, I, I love a you know I, I love a good uh, thrift store or secondhand store and, and go, we go in there and um, there was this I mean you see these racks of clothes and you start looking at the price tags and uh, there wasn't a price tag for under five juta for just like a single item of clothing. Uh, there was this one, one sweater that was so ugly, it just had like six eyebrows on it that were huge eyebrows, bushy eyebrows, you know. And I just had to look at the price tag, and it was 10 juta. And I'm thinking, this is the second-hand price, all right? Uh, there was a bag, a bag that uh, just was ugly. I mean, if any of you were wearing it, you'd probably get made fun of if you were carrying this thing. You'd look at the price tag, 100 juta. For a bag, a little purse bag, I'm thinking, poof, all right? So it was that kind of mall. Now, there was this one store, uh, you, you walk in, um, and it's a Lamborghini car dealership, like inside the mall. And, and, and they just had, they had uh, two or three just really beautiful cars. One was this classic Lamborghini. I mean, just, just beautiful, the kind of things you love to look at, but you don't even want to know the price. All right, so I, I want you to think in your mind about what your, like if you could have your dream car, like any car in the world, what would it be? All right, uh, maybe it's that Lamborghini. Um, maybe it's, a, it's a, a, one of the Teslas that have the windows that don't really break, right? <laughs> uh, wh whatever it is, uh, th think about it for a moment. And I, I want you to think about like getting it home from the from the, um, uh, the from the car dealership. In fact, the car dealership delivers it to your house, and it rolls off the the truck. And uh, you you look at it, zero miles on this thing. I mean, it, it's just it's been on the the truck to even get to you. So there's no miles. No one's ever driven it. And you think before I before I uh, drive this. I got to I got to wash it make sure that it's washed and waxed and it looks great all right because I want this thing to shine. So you're in the middle of washing it, you're waxing it and uh, all of a sudden these two guys come up to you and they're like uh, hey, um, we need your car. 
whoa, slow your roll here, friend. Um, what do you mean you need my car? Uh, yeah, um, our pastor, our pastor told us to come and to tell you that we need your car. Uh, I don't know how you would feel about that, um, but I would be like, you need to change churches because uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure your pastor is going to get this request, right? This is my new car. It's never been driven. You're not getting my car, right? Well, well this is sort of what happened in, in uh, Mark, Mark chapter 11, and, and for me, it's a very strange story. Uh, what Jesus asked his disciples to do, uh, but it's one that really speaks to us about obedience. So let's, let's look at it in Mark 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage in Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone, if anyone asks you, what are you doing, say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back, to, back here shortly. All right? <clears throat> you think if that's going to work with someone coming up for your brand new car. My pastor needs it, but don't worry. After he drives it a while, he's going to send it back shortly. Probably not working. So, first of all, I just want you to get in your mind how these disciples must have felt. I mean, we already know they were a little bit wishy-washy in their, in their faith, right? Even following Jesus, seeing the miracles. Uh, we even learned after they saw him feed the 5,000 that just a, a month or two later, they were doubting if he could feed the 4,000 with, with limited rations of, of food. So we know they were a little wishy-washy in, the, in their faith, even walking with Jesus. Can you imagine how they must have felt when Jesus said, hey, go into town, find this, this cult of a donkey, and, and, and take it. And if anyone asks you why you're taking it, say, say the Lord needs it. Um, I don't know about you, but walking in, like I would have probably been praying, God, don't let there be a donkey here. Don't let this, let this be a test. He just wanted to see that I was willing to go. All right? But I don't want to go take a donkey from somebody. All right? But they did go. They went, and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there. Oh, and, and I'm sure here, here it is. Oh, here it is. Here it is, right? I don't know what the penalty was for stealing someone's donkey, but uh, if it's like the wild, wild west, I mean, uh, stealing someone's horse meant death. Right? I don't know what the, what the uh, penalty was, but I, I'm sure that stealing a donkey held a high price if you were, if you were caught stealing someone's animals. All right, so, so there were some people standing there, and sure enough, just as Jesus said, they asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And they answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the ground while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead of them followed, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father David. Hosanna in the highest. Uh, if you skip down to verse 24, just want to draw reference to this after that triumphal entry. Um, um, Jesus told his disciples in, in verse 24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, uh, and it will, be, it will be yours. So just a few points in the few minutes that we, that we, have, uh, that we have here on this idea of, of obedience. Because what I have found in my life uh, is obedience isn't always easy. Like there are some things that it's, that it's easy to obey, obey God in. But there's, there's some things that God asks you to do um, that aren't easy, aren't easy to obey. In, in fact, it's, it's difficult. I have to imagine for the disciples, this was one of those moments that uh, there was some trepidation in, in their obedience to this, to this situation. 
So let me just give you a few thoughts on, on obeying when it's not, not easy. Uh, the first is this. God will often ask us to do things that have never been done before. Or we could say it this way. God will often ask us to do things that we have never done before. Um, now, I, the, the disciples probably weren't drawing correlation. I mean, they, they didn't want Jesus to... Uh, they didn't want Jesus to die on the cross. They were expecting this, this Messiah, this kingship figure to come in. And I think that's what they were hoping for in, in Jesus being the, the, the Messiah and the Savior. Um, but I don't even, I, I doubt in my mind that when Jesus told them to go get the cult, I doubt that they were going back to Old Testament prophecy and saying, oh, this is that moment. This is that moment that the prophets spoke about where he's going to come into town <clears throat> riding on a colt. Not, not a stallion, right? but he's going to come in riding on a, on a colt uh, like Zechariah said. I, I doubt they were putting that, those two together in this, in this situation. Um, they, Jesus was asking them to do something that no doubt they had never done before. They didn't fully, they didn't fully understand. In fact, he was, they weren't just going to get a cult. They were getting, going to get a cult that had never been ridden before. Here's what, I wanna, here's what I wanna say to you. Don't be afraid when you feel the Lord leading you to do something that you have never done before. Oftentimes when we are called upon to do something that we've never done before, we will allow fear to grip our hearts. And it's okay to have that sort of gut check moment. But many times what we do is we associate that idea of fear or that idea of, of maybe being scared in the moment as maybe the Holy Spirit trying to warn us from something, all right? And we all know there's that fine line, like when is it the Holy Spirit trying to keep us from something, and when is it the enemy trying to, trying to keep us from stepping into God's will? And I think sometimes because like the disciples, when Jesus said, go find this donkey that's never been ridden and just take it, like that's stealing, Jesus was asking them to go steal or to borrow, but the owner probably wasn't thinking, borrow, you're taking my donkey. That's stealing, right? So I'm sure there was that gut check moment. And sometimes we often over, overthink those moments. We get caught up in the fear and we allow that fear because we've never done that before. We don't know how it's going to turn out, keeping us from taking that step of obedience. Um, when you know that God has said, do it, even though it's never been done before, trust him with it. You don't have to, you don't have to have a three week prayer meeting over it. If God said to do it, do it. Quit overthinking it. Quit allowing your fear to grip you and do it. I love the fact that we don't even hear the conflict within his disciples, though I have to believe their whole way walking to this, this, uh, uh, this place. I, had to, I have to believe that they were having a conflict and that what if we get there and like we go to, there's no donkey, or what if we get there and we go to take it and it don't turn out like the master said? Just, just do it. Secondly, uh, God will often ask us to do things that other people don't understand. Right? Certainly, um, even though for whatever reason these people just said, Silicon, here, take the donkey. Uh, you have to believe that they're like, what is going on here? Like, there, there is no way, there is no way this made sense to anyone in this equation. All right? But God will often call us to do things that other people don't understand. That's why we have to be careful from where we get our validation in life. Like if we're drawing our validation, if we're, if we're drawing our, our confirmations about what we should or shouldn't do from what other people are saying or not saying, we will find ourselves in trouble or missing God or not obeying God a whole lot. Right? Um, I, I love this quote. I don't know who said it, but... Ships don't sink because the water around them. Ships sink because the water that gets in them. 
you have a lot of voices that are around you, all right? And, and if you allow those voices to get in you, you're going to often... You're going to often miss God or you're going to often not obey when the Lord speaks to your life. So be careful. Be careful of those voices that are around you. How many of them or who among them you allow into the boat of your life. All right? Because it's okay as long as they're just around you. But everyone around you don't need to know your business. All right? So make sure... Make sure that you're careful with those that you let in the, in the boat with you. And lastly, because I know we're running out of time, um, faith is belief and trust in God's abilities. Not your own. So don't overthink this thing. Don't put your trust in your abilities. Don't begin to doubt because you're seeing something that you can't do. Faith isn't about what you can do. Faith is about trusting what God can do. I've, I've been made a fool of so many times going into, a, going into a store, going into a mall, going into a bathroom somewhere. Like, I, I literally, this happened a couple of weeks ago where I'm, I'm, I met in the, in the bathroom at a, at a mall, and I'm like sticking my hands under a sink, like trying to get soap out, and like nothing's coming out. And I'm like, I keep waving my hand. You ever done that? These little automatic? I'm like, <clears throat> and I think of, I'll wave it harder, it's going to come out. And, and, then, and then the guy beside me after I'm there, he reached over and just twist a knob. <laughs> this wasn't an automatic thing. Right? Um, sometimes I, I think, uh, you know, I, I come to God and I'm like, and I'm just like wanting him to do for me everything. But, but faith, our faith is the twist of the knob. Like it'd be nice if we just came to God and said, just pour it out on me, God. Here I am, automatic, just let it happen. But faith is a trust in God's abilities. And faith takes an action point of trust on our end. It's twisting the knob. It's saying, God, I give this totally to you. I relinquish myself to your control. I'm trusting in your abilities. I'm turning the knob because my, it's not automatic. My action is not enough. I'm trusting in you, Lord. And we've got to do it. All right, let me pray. God, we love you. We thank you. Help us all to be obedient in the lives we live. We thank you for it in your name. Amen. <coughs>